Go ahead and turn the books to Daniel, and as our children are dismissed to Children's Church. Well, folks, Ira, thank you for sharing. And uh, they're actually going to be lending us their shower trailer for our mission team. Uh, this summer, we have a team coming from South Carolina. And um, he's going, they're going to be staying here at the church. And they're going to need a, um, a place to shower. And uh, disaster is a leaf unless there's a major disaster. You say, so we have one in a while, you watch it be that week. <laughs> but uh, they're going to be letting us use uh, that. Jim, it is good to see you here this morning, my friend. Oh, man. Folks, I tell you what, amen. Hey, give God the glory. <laughs> now, some of you don't know this, but uh, about three or four weeks ago, um, and he won't mind me sharing, me and him were sitting there talking, and, and we were talking about him stepping over into eternity. We thought he was just days away from seeing Jesus face to face. But God said, not yet, my friend, not yet. I'm not through with you here. Not yet. Well, folks, I've been here for a few months, and uh, I don't know how to start this out this morning other than uh, this old boy came loaded for bear. Uh, God's laid something on my heart, and I'm going to share it. And I'm going to preach it the way it's supposed to be preached. And I'm not going to worry about uh, feelings. I'm not going to be concerned with the state that God has placed me in. I agree with the, the statement that I ought to make. And some of you may not agree with that. But folks, I've traveled and I'm here to tell you there's some things that's going on in this country and going on in New Mexico. And, and we need to understand that God's not going to put up with it. So this morning, it's entitled Living Examples, Living Examples, how God desires to see men and women become the living examples of the gospel of Christ. And I'm talking about the real gospel, the gospel that calls us through love and grace and mercy, beholds us through faith and living the commandments of God. So this morning, we'll be talking about that. There was a a man, not a great man by no means, I don't even have his name, but he wrote a declaration while he was in Africa, imprisoned for his faith, soon to be martyred. And this was one of the last things he ever wrote. I would like to read it to you this morning because it will certainly set the tone. The die has been cast. The decision has been made. I have stepped over the line. I won't look back, let up, slow down, or back away. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. I'm done with low living, sight walking, small planning, colorless dreams, tamed visions, mundane talking, cheap living, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, or popularity. I do not have, to, I do not have the right to... I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith. Lean on his presence, walk with his patience, live by prayer, labor with power. My face is set, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions are few. My guide is reliable, my mansion, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of adversity, negotiate at the table of my enemies, ponder at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up until I have stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, and spoken up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, Richard's about to cut a dance. Boy, I'm here to tell you, folks. What if that was the battle cry of the church today? What if we really lived the way this man lived? Let you say, well, folks, that, uh, pastor, that's a good speech. He wrote this because he was about to die, because he was imprisoned for his faith. Folks, I'm telling you, it would be a miracle if many Christians would show up to church on a rainy Sunday. We've played... Too long. 
And let me tell you something, I'm tired of hearing this. And so don't tell me again. Now, preacher, you're in New Mexico now. You can't preach like that in New Mexico. You're going to offend people's feelings. We, we're not like that out here. Folks, God is God wherever you are. And if you ain't been told the truth, that's not my fault. Living examples. Men and women of God that, that are so impassioned, like you saw Ira up here. Listen, he believes in what he's doing, and it shows. Do people believe in the way you live? And the truth is, they do. The question is, what are you living for? In our text today, we're going to be looking at three men um, <laughs> Every time I say this, I, I smile because uh, uh, I say this is one of my favorite parts of the Bible. And, and Judy just laughs. She says, oh, preacher, every time you open the Bible, you say this is one of my favorite parts of the Bible. But I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are three young men. They're around the age of 17 to 22. Let me give you a little 10-second side sermon. Stop telling our kids that are under the age of 18 or 19. Well, they're just 18 or 19. Goodness gracious, they're grown men and women of God. Put some, bear, put some burden on their heart. I did college and student ministry for years, and I'd, have, I'd actually have parents come up. Well, now, preacher, they're only 21, 22 when they're in college. They're doing the best they can. Good. You think college is hard? Try going to college married with two kids, working a full-time job, leading two other ministries, and still carry a full load and graduate with honors. That's hard. I'd walk in. I ain't trying to be mean to college students. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'd walk into college. My class is at 8 o'clock. Here I am married at, uh, at 2 o'clock, and I'd walk in and had to get up at 5 o'clock because believe it or not, contrary to what some people say, I had to change some diapers, and I had to do some things. I hated it, but I did it. And I'd go in at 8 o'clock and I'd have these college students coming in and they'd be in there and still in their pajamas looking like they just got up because they did. They had just gotten up. Oh, this is so hard. And the problem is you got moms and dads saying, well, they're just college students. Let me tell you something. Our young men and women will step up if we give them the, uh, the opportunity to step up. My boys, every night, and dad, I'm just a teenager. I said, but biblically, you're a grown man by the standard of the Bible. At age 13, you're considered a grown man. You'd be under apprenticeship. Suck it up and be a man and grow up and act like God's put some hair on your back. Although we don't grow hair on our back in my family because we just don't. Because <laughs> Job, Job went to the mirror one time and said, dad, I said, it's a figure of speech, son. But here's the thing. Three young men. Three young men. And they're doing more standing up for God at this age than most men ever will. You see, they were giving a very easy task. Just, just succumb. Just give in. Forget who they were, Israelites. Give, forget who, uh, where they were and, um, in a foreign nation and who they served. God and God alone. Let me set you up a little stage. There was this king and he was all that. At least he thought he was. So much so he built an image and said everyone needs to fall down and worship this image. And if you don't fall down and worship this image, you will be put to death. Now we may not be having golden images put up in America, but let me tell you something. We have, we have fake lies and deception being pawned off as truth. And we're told if we don't accept it, that we'll be punished for it. Well, bring it on, my friends. My God is greater. These three young men stood up in the face of tyranny. And God did a miraculous thing. Read with me in the scriptures, Daniel 3, 8 through 12. Daniel 3, 8 through 12. We'll actually be reading more than that today. <clears throat> Starting in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that, and <clears throat> that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. 
There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay you no attention. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Let us pray. Father, just a few days ago, you entered in my heart and said, you have a message you want to share. And Father, I must admit that I was timid. Fearful of what people may think or say, but you reminded me it's not about them, it's about you. So Father, I pray, Lord, that I would truly be nothing but a broken vessel this morning to share your word, restored through the power of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that there will not be enmity between me or you or anyone in this room. So, Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our arrogance. Forgive us of our pride. God, forgive us for thinking we know more about your word than you do. God, forgive us for lackadaisical attitudes. God, forgive us for worships that aren't filled with Holy Spirit hearts. God, forgive us for following schedules. Forgive us for following the mundane. God, forgive us for looking for a vision that lacks luster. God, forgive us for not putting goals before our eyes that only you can meet. God, forgive us for fear. So, Father, I pray that you would forgive us for each and every sin named and not named. And God, move amongst each and every heart. God, let the hearts of men burn. For the righteousness and the touch of your hand. And God, let it be contagious to all that come in our presence. So Father, let us not be concerned with time this morning. Let us not be a slave to a clock and a schedule. But God, a slave to the spirit and what it would have said. For God, there's nothing more important. Let me say this, Father, again in prayer. There's nothing more important in this church than the preaching of your word. And let us bow down to that truth. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, amen. So here we see these three young men, they're, 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 they're out and uh, they got these people, they're watching them. You see, people are always going to watch you, folks. There's people out there called watchers. That old devil uses them real good. They're watching every single thing you do. They're watching what you say, how you live. They're watching you in elementary school. They're watching you in middle, high, college. They're watching you to the day you die, my friends. And what did we see from these three men about being a living example? What it means to be a true living example. Here's one thing we learned from them. They would not bow. They would not bow. Living examples do not bow to anyone but God. Look what it says in verse 12. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Now, how did the king know that these men were, were um, bowing down? If everyone's supposed to be bowed down with their eyes shut, worshiping this image, how did they know that they weren't doing it? Because there's watchers. It's kind of like many times I'll say, if everyone just please shut their eyes, there's no one's business. Ah, oh, there's always two or three. I know, because I see you. That's why you hear me say it again. I mean, everyone needs to shut their eyes. Ooh. He saw me. Yeah, I got a good view. But people are watching. And see, these men, they were watching for one thing, to bring an indictment against these men, to make a mockery of them, to get them in trouble. You see, when you really begin to live for God, the whole reason this even took place was because Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were righteous men. They walked with God. They honored God in every aspect of their life, not just on Sunday mornings, not in front of mom and dad or the pastor or people that they know to walk righteously. No, they walked with God in every aspect of their life and it ticked the watchers off. You see, all this was done to get these men in trouble. And let me tell you something. If you don't feel the devil against you, then something's wrong in your walk with the Lord. You see, they said, if you don't bow down, 
You're going to pay the price. My friends, Christ paid the price. Mark 10, 33 through 35. We're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. But look at this. They will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. The scriptures say that we need to understand the same thing is going to happen to us. Mark 13, 12 through 14. Now the brother, listen to this. See if this doesn't sound like today. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death and the father the son. And the children shall rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that shall endure to, unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now look, some people use that to say that that's a scripture of, of works. They're trying to say Christianity is a scripture of works. That's not what it's saying. You know what, you know what until the end, people that are really faithful, now listen to this, because this is where we start separating the wheat from the chaff. Those that are truly faithful, those that truly, now listen, those that truly believe this word, they will endure to the end. But those that don't, they'll start stepping off the train. Well, God, I was with you up until I didn't agree with you anymore. You mean to tell me, preacher, there's things about this book that, that, that are hard to swallow? Absolutely. But I can still swallow it. You see, the world says you can't believe in this. The world says you can't have faith in this. But the word of God says, not only, you better, you, not only had you better believe in it, but you better stand on it. And you better not bow down. Look what it says in the scriptures here. Verse 10, you, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. We live in a day and a time when the culture says, you better do this. You better, we'll take you to the courts. We'll put you in prison. We'll take everything away from you. We live in a world where there's no such thing as tolerant. And, and let me tell you something, folks. I'm tired of people saying, well, the Christian needs to be tolerant. The Christian needs to be faithful is what the Christian needs to be. It's time we need to start stepping up and living the example of grace and mercy by the hand and the power of God's might, not the U.S. Supreme Court. But Brad, this is the country we live in. This is God's country. And you know what? Every country is God's country. We're all playing in his sandbox, folks. He's the God of creation and all things. And no matter how much man's sovereignty tries to impose its will on God, God is still on the throne. The question I have for you this morning is, are you bowing down to the cultural demands of the world? And let me tell you something, the church is. Well, preacher, we, we just need to bow down so that we can, we can grow to mega church status. Well, pastor, we just need to bow down so people will like us. Listen, folks, you better be more worried about your walk with God than people liking you. I, I, by the time I get through with this, I promise you this, there's going to be some people walking out this church. I don't know if they'll know what he's for us anymore. Well, if going to a God fearing Bible-based church is not for you. Go to the ones that are up and down this street that are wicked-based. And they'll tickle your ears and tell you what you want to hear as long as you bow down to the culture. We bow down to no man. We bow down to no deceit. We bow down to no lie. We are children of God. And what does the royalty of the throne of heaven have to do with the filth and the sin of the world. We bow down to no one. Vance Abner had this to say. One of the greatest preachers of all time. It'll be up on the screen if you want to write it down. I pray that this is not true of any member of Del Norte Baptist Church. Most church members live so far below the standard 
and I would say of God's will. You'd have to backslide to be in fellowship. We're so subnormal that if we were to become normal, people would think we were abnormal. The church has lost its teeth. The church has lost its bite. But it's not because God is not sovereign and on the throne. It's because we have bowed our hearts to the deceits and the lies of the world. And here we have three young men living the example at a young age saying, look, kill us. Take everything we got. But we will not bow down to you and the gods of this world. Not only would they not bow down, they just would not live compromised lives. You see, we're doomed for failure if we live compromised lives. We're doomed for failure. So this morning, I want us to first understand that God does not want us to bow down, but neither does he want us to bend. You said they wouldn't bend. It'd been easy to make excuses. Hey, I, I had to get, we do that, don't we? Well, preacher, we have to give in. We, we have to give in. If we don't give in, then, then what would people think? If, if we just gave in just a little bit here, or you know what, preacher, we can give in a little bit. We don't, we don't have to say we believe every single aspect of God. And, and we, we just, just spend a little bit, preacher. Just if, if you'll just, if it was just this chapter here or this verse here, you know, because that's so offensive. If we would bend just a little bit, people would love us. God didn't call you to be loved by the people. He called you to be their servant. These three men, these three men stood on the precipice. Let me ask you a question. Do you think they were the only Jews there? You think the other Jews didn't notice that these men stood? You see, we, we are just shout at me. Just get down here, man. Just get It's no big deal. Just bow down to it. It's no big deal. Come on. They're going to kill you, man. You live, live, live to fight another day. Uh, uh, whatever it takes, just bow, down, just bow down to their gods. Bow down to the authority. Come on, get down there. What they're really saying is, man, I wish I had the strength to stand like that, but I'm a coward. I'm amazed at Shadrach, Meshach. They were probably amazed when they looked around and they saw that they were the only three standing. Folks, what if Del Norte's the only church left in New Mexico? I'm not saying we are, but what if we were the only church left and everyone else saying, just give in, just give in. Would we give in or do we make our stand? But preacher, what if, what if we lost everything? What if we lost our church? What if we lost our facility and our property? What if we lost tax exemption? God forbid we don't stay faithful to God if we don't get to deduct it. My friends, children of God do not bend. In verses 13 through 15, then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. Isn't that what happens to Christians today? Well, if you don't do what we tell you to do, we're going to be ticked off at you and we're going to drag you before the courts. No difference here. Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set in today's language? Is it true, Christian brother, that you don't do like we tell you to do, that you don't bow down to the law that we say you must follow? Now, if you are ready when you hear the sound of the horn, the pipe, the lyre, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image I have made well and good. But now if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God? Now listen to this. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I'm going to give you one more shot. You three young men. We're going to do this over. 
And I don't care what kind of excuse, I don't care what you got to say to yourself, but you will bow down to my authority. You see, that's what we're being told today. Now, I know some of you are sitting there saying, well, boy, I, the preacher's talking about the homosexual agenda. I'm talking about the agenda of sin and all sin. I'm still against pot. I'm still against abortion. Now, you need to understand that. I've only said that one other time, but I want to make sure you understand. I'm clear on that. I'm against abortion. Well, now, I've heard, and I heard someone say, I can show biblically where it's okay. Please show me. I've been studying this word for, for 20-something years. I've gone all the way up to my doctorate. That don't mean I'm just highly educated. It means I spend a little time. And I ain't never seen where God said you can rip the womb apart and destroy his creation. Well, preacher, there are circumstances. Let me tell you something. As a church, and I agree with what one person told me, and we should make a biblical stand on abortion, but you know what? We ought to make a biblical stand to help those young girls through that hard time. Instead of throwing God's word at them, we ought to love them through compassion. That's why you're going to, um, in the near future, what Carol shared with you last week, I'm praying about it. I think we as a church should have a, a, a part in that. And I don't mean just taking up an offering. Get these women off the streets. And people are like, we need to get them off the streets. Well, you know what? Most of them ain't there because they chose to be. They're because they're forced to be. But our society says, you need to accept this. You need to accept this. You need to accept this. Folks, we don't have to accept anything. Have you ever been asked to compromise? Your boss comes in and says, look, I need you to overlook this or lie. Your friends try to get you to lie or deceive another. You're under pressure to cave in, to give in, or be in to what you know is 100% wrong. Just overlook it this one time. Just overlook it this one time. Folks, let me tell you something. That's a dangerous road to travel. Because the next thing you know, you don't even remember what the truth looks like. And I'm afraid to say that many in the church today don't even know what truth looks like. They're offended by it, but they sure don't know what it looks like. We've bent and and contorted and become so much of a pretzel, we don't even understand God's word anymore. But not these three young men. They stood. They could have sat there and thought, surely God doesn't want me to suffer or to die. But that's not what they said. Let's read verses 16 through 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be, if this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. King, I don't care how many times you play your music, and I don't care how much you threaten me. I'll never serve you. You say, well, pastor, who's the golden image of? It was of Nebuchadnezzar. It was about a 40, 60-foot statue made out of gold of Nebuchadnezzar. You talk about a man with a power trip. He thought he was a god and should be worshipped. You ever met people that get so high up on the train of leadership, they kind of think they above everyone else? Yeah, they're out there, aren't they? You know, I think, let me me tell you this. I ain't going to be political, but let me tell you this. If we ever want to change Washington, we better realize it's not about Democrats or conservatives or Republicans or the Libertarians. It's about this. They serve us. We don't serve them. And if we don't stop just putting people in, well, you know, I'm of this party. Well, preacher, you sound like you're a Republican. No, I'm a Christian. I vote conservative values. Now, it ain't my fault most of them lean that way that I go with. But the point is, is we vote Christian, not party. Stop bending to what everyone tells us to do and start laying the church. What if there was a new party in America? The Christian party. But we stood up and we believed what God said instead of saying it's impossible. Friends, we need to stop making excuses and start living the example. We need to leave it in God's hands, putting our future 
in God's hands. I put it this way, putting our future and our faith and our faith in our Father. We cannot live compromised lives. Because when we begin to live compromised lives, we begin to live apathetic. It's no big deal. It's, hey, this, this isn't no big deal. We'll start singing in, there's, I've got a church back home. It runs 40, 50,000 people on Sunday mornings. But you know what, Jennifer? You know what I've heard? They don't even pray, play Christian music half the time. They play whatever's hot. That matter of fact, uh, if you walk into their, um, not too long ago, someone visited and walked out and they left the church because they were playing Katy Perry's, I kissed a girl and I liked it. Talking about two women kissing. They were playing that as people came in. They got their coffee and donuts. I'm not against the coffee and the donuts part. Some are, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not prejudiced to sugar. I'm just allergic to it. It makes me inflate. <laughs> they play, for Easter Sunday morning, they played Highway to Hell as our opening worship song. Yeah. And then when you call them out, oh, poor woe's us. It's just not fair. Poor woe's us. Everybody's beating up on us. They're not beating up on you. They're beating up on the sin that's infected your church. And when I came here, let me, let me tell you something. This is what I was told by many. Now, preacher, you understand this, this church is this and, and we're this and we're this. And, and they said, can you handle that? And I said, let me tell you something. I said, I don't know what it was, but I know what it would be if I'm your pastor. It's going to be a God that follow, It's going to be a, a church that follows the Word of God and the Word of God alone. That's why you know I haven't had my office flooded yet, and this is why. If you ever want to come and challenge me on one of my viewpoints, that's fine. But you better bring the Word of God. You better be loaded for bear. You better bring Scripture to back up what you believe. Because let me tell you something: I have nothing but the defense of the Word of God. And if I'm wrong, I'll be the first to get down in front of this church, in front of every one of you, and beg for forgiveness from God and you. You see, I don't, I don't like it when people say, well, preacher, I just, in my heart, I just feel this way. It doesn't matter what you feel. God didn't ask your opinion. Well, preacher, that sounds so hurtful. Look, in my house, sometimes I've got to make some stands and not everybody's happy with me. But I'm the father. I'm held accountable for the way I treat my wife and raise my kids. And I take it seriously. God's not playing games. And the church shouldn't either. My friends, we should not bend. I'm tired of seeing Christians bend. Somewhere along the road, and let me say this. We brought in the American mentality to the church. Well, this is the land of the free and, and we're supposed to prosper. Surely God wouldn't want me to suffer. Surely God wouldn't want me to go without. Surely God, because I live in America, God wouldn't want me to lose everything. No, everyone we read about in the Bible lost everything, but not people that live in America. No, see, God has to conform unto, unto our ideals. That load, Folks, that's a bunch, well, that's just not good stuff. You know, maybe God does want you to suffer. Well, that's not fair. Who are you to call out the sovereign king of the universe? What's fair and is not fair. Our reward is in heaven, not on this piece of dirt. I lived a life for many years where I was very healthy and, and very strong. Now I live most days suffering. For the last two and a half years, I've not had hardly one day where I did not suffer. I'm suffering as I speak to you right now. I'm uncomfortable. And I pray God to forgive, to, to, to relieve me of this every day. And I've gone to doctors and I've gone to everything I can. And here's what they say. There's only one way to fix it. And I said, well, I'm not going to do that. Then you'll suffer. But I can preach. I can walk. I mean, I can pick nothing up heavy. It's amazing, isn't it? At one time, I was considered one of the strongest men in the world. Now, if I pick up over 50 pounds, I can't walk the next day. Yeah, it makes me a little mad. It makes me a little angry. But is it God's fault? 
Am I going to run to the throne of God and whine like a little baby? Or thinking that I got one more day? Let me tell you something. I don't care if you can walk or if you're in a wheelchair. I don't care if you've got the best sight in the world or if you're wearing contacts like me and it's still not working or you got to wear uh, Coke bottle bottoms. If you got breath in your lungs, praise God because you got one more opportunity to share Jesus. Don't bend. Don't make excuses. Lastly, they wouldn't burn. My Sunday school teachers, I love you. Please forgive me, but you understand I'm going past 930 this morning. You'll have your time. And, if you, and I ain't trying to be mean, folks. I said Wednesday night. Let me say here. If you've got to cut your donut and coffee time a little short this morning, let me preach God's word. Don't, don't run out of here. I got to get the coffee made. We'll survive. But if you're more concerned about getting your coffee than you are finishing hearing God's word, then you go on. Because apparently this message wasn't for you. But they wouldn't burn. Daniel 24 through 25. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bounded into the fire? At this point, they've cast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire. Now, some people say they were able to walk in this furnace and they were cool spots in a furnace. My friends, go home and test that theory this afternoon. Get a, hot, get a fire as hot as you can. Go get you a 50, drum, a 50 drum barrel and you load it up with gasoline and, and, and the paper and every single thing you can find and you just load it up and you get as hot as you can and reach in and grab the cool spot. See if you don't get burned. It said that the men that threw them into the furnace died from the heat. They didn't even go in it. They were just near it and they died in the heat. Then the king looks in. I don't know how he looks in. I guess he's way up. He declared to his counselors, did we not throw, did we not cast three men beyond bound in the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see four men unbound, unbound, walking in the midst of the fire. And they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Christ, now understand this. Even if you throw us in the furnace and it costs us our lives, God is with us. But instead of being consumed by the fire, Christ said, I'm going to walk with you. I said this not too long ago. One of the scariest places you'll ever be in your life is when you come before the altar of God and you say, Father, I'm ready to walk through the fire. It took me 14 years to pray that prayer. 14 years. And let me tell you something. You better be ready to walk through it. But I'll say this on the other side. It's glorious. What fear was stealing was the glorious power of the Spirit in my life. God walked with them through the fire. God was with them. My brother, God's been with you through this. And though we thought you were going to step out into eternity, God said, I'm not through with you yet. Just by you sitting here in this presence brings encouragement to many of us this morning. What a testimony. I went and visited Dick Harden and Ralph Aaron. And we weeped. I spent, I didn't, and look, now folks, you need to understand, if your pastor comes, I'm not one of these pastors to come in and say, look, I got about five minutes to spend with you. I'm going to pull up a chair. We're going to talk for a little while. Because I love you. I want to, I, I want, I love you. Understand this. I love you. I preach you don't know me. That's okay. I still love you. I love you. And I want to spend time with you. And I sat there with Ralph. And I sat there with Dick and we began to talk. And, and folks, I don't, I don't pull no punches. Well, you got 15, 20 years left. That's a lie. We know that. They know that unless God deems it so. I began, we began to talk. And Ralph said, you know, it won't be long now. And I said, no, nah, Ralph, it probably won't be, buddy. I said, what do you look forward to, Ralph? I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see Jesus. I said, you're looking forward to see Jesus, huh? He said, I'm tired and I'm hurting and I'm old. But I lived a good life. And I honor God. 
Pastor Brad, I'm going to see Jesus. And I said, Ralph, I have no doubt of that. And then I sat there. Folks, let me tell you something. Dick Carden has been softened in a way that only God can. And I sat there with him and said, Dick, he, he said, it won't be long now, preacher. It's amazing. They were saying the same thing. Won't be long now, preacher. Won't be long now. And I said, it probably won't be, Dick. You're right, Dick. It won't be long. You're gonna... And I said, what are you looking forward to? He said, I'm going to see my wife. And I'm going to see Jesus. I said, Dick, what are you most proud of? Now listen to this. My God loved me. My wife took care of me. And tears were pouring out of his eyes as he laid on the bed, in the, uh, laying on his side, and just his pillow soaked. And he said, and my children honor me. My children honor me. Last week, I had an individual pull me off to the side. And for 45 minutes, this individual told me what a terrible pastor I am. Told me how I was one of the largest disappointments he'd ever seen. I didn't do enough. I didn't give enough. I believe it was unjustified in what he said, but it still hurt. It was last Sunday. I called Tony and said, Tony, it's been a little bit of a rough day. I said, someone just told me I was a terrible person. And folks, you know, we say, you just got to learn to shrug it off. And we do, we do, we do, don't we, Brother Joe? We learn, but it still hurts. So I was just laying across the bed, watching something. I'm sure it was theological and based, something like swamp people or Alaskan bush people. You know, we make fun of those guys, Alaskan bush people, but sometimes going off up into Alaska and getting away from everyone doesn't seem that bad, does it? Does it, Brother Kevin? I don't know. I, I guess uh, my wife had told me after what I'm about to share with you. I said, Tony, did you say anything to the boys? I just told me you had a rough day that someone gave you a hard time. But I was laying across the bed, and Caleb came in there and sat down on the corner of the bed. And I said, son, you okay? Yeah, Dad. Now, my son's 14 years old. He's got him a little girlfriend. He's not supposed to have girlfriends, but apparently that doesn't matter. <laughs> so, Dad, I want you to know you're a good pastor. Well, son, I, where's that coming from? Uh, yeah, and he did say, he said, well, Dad, Mom said you had a rough day today and someone gave you a hard time. That's all she said. But dad, I want you to know you're a good pastor. I said, well, son, I appreciate that, but your view's probably a little skewed. You're, I'm, your, I'm your dad. He said, but don't, but, but, now I'm, I know this is going to sound like he's talking big, and I'm sitting there in amazement. It had to be the Holy Spirit <laughs> coming through him because usually it's yeah and what and dude and no. That's about the, most conversations. I said, your opinion's probably a little skewed, son. He said, Dad, you've been in my life, my whole life. And, I've, and you're my pastor, my father, and I've listened to you preach many times. He said, and you're a good pastor. And I said, what are you trying to say, son? He said, well, I'm not saying you're the best speaker. Thanks, son. <laughs> but Dad, everything you say in the pulpit, you live at home. You've taught me to be honest. You've taught me what it's like to walk when people hate you. You taught me what it's like to trust in the word of God even when you don't always understand it. You treat mama good. There's never been anything I've wanted that you haven't met the need, daddy. And you love everyone. You're not prejudiced or racist or to anyone. You, you really love everyone, Dad. And even when we make a little joke that we might have heard at school, you call us out on it. We're not, you're not allowed to make racist or, or judgmental jokes in my house. And Dad, as far as I'm concerned, that makes you a good pastor. 
So while Bill was, he said that to me on Sunday, and while Bill said, and I've got children that honor me, I wept because it was just a few days earlier, my son was saying, Father, I honor you. You see, my friends, Christians won't burn. We may go through the fiery furnaces of life, but we're not going to burn. Because God is faithful to his promise. He said he'd walk with us. It tells us, and I'm coming to a close, 2 Corinthians 6.16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people, my friends. You will not burn because you are children of the living God. And no matter what people say about you in or outside the church and no matter what people say or how they feel about how you you stand on this word, God will make it holy in your heart. And you too will be a living example. We will not make excuses at Del Norte Baptist Church, nor will we compromise. We will not sit at the table of our enemies, nor will we, nor will we make dreams. They're not big enough that only God can feel. Well, preacher... The goal, uh, these goals, some of these goals you give are unrealistic. I prayed and these are the goal that God gave me that only he can feel. Why? Because we do what God says we can do, not what we can think in of ourselves. Del Norte Baptist Church will be a living example of people that love each other, that love the world. But most of all, love God. Where are you at this morning? Where's your walk at this morning? Have you bowed? Have you bent? Are you afraid of the fire? I'm telling you in your heart this morning, you can stand up before Satan in his dirty, rotten dominion and say, I don't care what you put me through. I bow to God alone. Are you willing to make that covenant? Do you need to make that covenant? Maybe this morning for the first time in your life, you need Jesus. He'll change everything. Preacher, I don't think I can live that way. You can't if Jesus is in your life. I used to be scared. I used to have fear. But when Jesus came in and I realized that he would walk with me no matter what, I began to understand that I could do anything that God asked me to do. And so can you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Submit, therefore, James 4, 7. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You may see the flames, but they'll never harm a hair on your head. It says that they walked out, these three men, and nothing, their clothes were fine, their hair was fine. That's an awful lot of cold spots, ain't it? They were fine because they were in the presence of God. This morning, maybe you need to step into the presence of God. Maybe you need to be that grandfather, that grandmother before your children and your grandchildren that you know you need to be. Maybe there's some sin in your life you need to ask for forgiveness for. But folks, let me tell you something. The church is eat up with sin. We eat up with sin and every other church is eat up with sin and we're trying to lie and act like it ain't there. Maybe this morning you just need to come down, not to me, but before the throne of God and quietly confess your sins and ask for forgiveness. Maybe you're looking for a church home. We're not a great church. We just serve a great God. We're not a perfect church, but we follow the perfect will. We'd love to have you.